بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله اللهم اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وبعد So to continue where we left off last week inshallah and we were speaking about the um, presence of the heart how to have a present heart in each of the um, actions of the prayer so we the uh, author Imam Ghazali rahimahullah ta'ala he's going through the actions of the prayer but from a a uh, a uh, more spiritual perspective so he says wa amma al-i'tidal waqa'iman فإنما هو مثول بالشخص والقلب بين يدي الله عز وجل فليكن رأسك الذي هو أرفع أعضائك مطرقا مستكينا وليكن وضع الرأس عن ارتفاعه تنبيها على إلزام القلب التواضع والتذلل So he says when you are standing and some of the fuqaha they consider the standing of the prayer to be for the sake of the sujood. So the sujood and the standing are considered to be two of the most important parts of the prayer. So he says, when you are standing upright, he says it's an act of basically presenting yourself, i.e. your person and your heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's like you're standing in the courtyard in front of a judge. فَلْيَكُنْ رَأْسُكَ الَّذِي هُوَ أَرْفَعُ أَعْطَائِكَ مُتْرِقًا مُسْتَكِينًا And so in that situation, in that state, your, um, your head, which is basically, it's the most, um, uh, it's the highest of your limbs, basically. Your head is the highest of your limbs. And it's often um, the limb which shows the level of a person's, um, I guess, arrogance or humility. An arrogant person, they walk with their head up and the humble person, we assume anyway, they walk with their head lowered. And so you can tell a person's confidence from the position of his or her head. If the head is up high, the person is, is, is seen to be confident. If the head is low, the person is seen to be lacking in confidence, etc. He says, so your, the, your head, which is the highest of your, your body, the highest limb of your body, it should be in a state of um, bowing and submission. And of course, with uh, with there's a balance to it because a person is not supposed to arch their neck. The, the, the back is supposed to be upright, but the head can be lowered to the extent that you're looking at the place of sujood. Um, then he says, وَلْيَكُنْ وَضْعُ الرَّأْسِ عَنِ ارْتِفَاعِهِ تَنْبِيهًا عَلَىٰ إِلْزَامِ الْقَلْبِ التَّوَاضُعْ وَالتَّذَلُّ And it should be an indication um, and I guess a reminder uh, to to uh, to lower your heart. So you're lowering your head in a state of lowering your heart. You're lowering your head so that you so that perhaps your heart may also be lowered to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala in a state of humility and tadallul. Tadallul is basically it's a state of um, it's something which is it's uh, it's lower than humility. It's where um, a person is basically broken. It's like being in a state of brokenness not being able to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you don't see yourself as worthy um, as standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, and free of arrogance. So when you lower your head in the salah, i.e. when you're standing and your head is low, then you are freeing your heart of arrogance and you are lowering yourself, your heart. Um, you're lowering yourself in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he says, uh, And what you should be thinking about, what you should be considering in this moment, what will help you to humble yourself, to lower yourself, to free yourself of arrogance, is to remind yourself of the enormity of standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and being in a position where you are going to be asked. And if you really think about this, like when you really read this, if you read it properly, then um, it should be something which is very worrying um, and something which makes you realize how lacking your prayer is and how um, serious we need to take the salah. As we said last week and the week before, one prayer will eventually be our last prayer. One prayer will eventually be our last prayer. And we want our last prayer to be the best of prayers that we pray. And that's one of the, the uh, practices of the earlier generation um, of the 
the awliya and the ulama, they used to pray each prayer as if it was their last prayer. Um, so he says, وَلْيَكُنْ عَلَى ذِكْرِكَ هَا هُنَا خَطْرُ الْقِيَامِ بَيْنِ يَدَيَ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ فِي هَوْلِ الْمَطْلِ عَنْدَ الْعَرْضِ عَلَى السُؤَالِ So when you're presenting yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be questioned, what is that situation going to be like? What are you going to be asked about? What sins um, do you have? Do you have any good deeds? And so on and so forth. So you're standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a state of um, hope, but in a state of fear. You're standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in, in the, the way that a person whose entire future depends upon the outcome of that standing. That's what it is. Imagine you're standing in front of a king of old and the king is going to decide whether you live or die. What type of situation are you going to be in? Your heart is going to be shaking. You're going to be afraid. Um, you're going to be worried. But at the same time, you're going to hope, especially if you know that king is... Um, is, is known for, for his generosity, known for his mercy, known for, for his kindness, etc. And of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is akramul akrimeen. He's the most generous of the gen generous. Um, arhamul rahimeen, the most merciful of those who are mercy, uh, merciful. And so um, when we stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yes, we remember our sins, we remember our mistakes, we remember our shortcomings, but we also remember who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. And then he says, وَعَلَمْ فِي الْحَالِ أَنَّكَ قَائِمٌ بَيْنِ يَدَيْ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ وَهُوَ مُطَّلِعٌ عَلَيْكَ فَقُمْ بَيْنِ يَدَيْهِ قِيَامَكَ بَيْنِ يَدَيْ بَعْضِ مُلُوكِ الزَّمَانِ He says, and remind yourself, take into consideration that as you are standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, هُوَ مُطَّلِعٌ عَلَيْكَ He is watching you. Um, he is watching you and his knowledge of you encompasses everything about you. Your inners and your outers, that which is concealed and that which is um, shown. And this is not only relevant to the prayer, but this is outside of the prayer. This is at all times. It's at all times. And the starting point is the prayer. The prayer is the starting point. If we can connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the prayer, then it leads to being able to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala outside of the prayer. فَقُمْ بَيْنِ يَدَيْهِ قِيَامَكَ بَيْنِ يَدَيْ بَعْضِ مُلُوكِ الزَّمَانِ And so stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just as you would stand in front of um, some of the kings of, of your time. And today, of course, the kings are weak. It's the, the nation states that have taken over. So the leaders of nation states. Um, in كُنْتَ تَعْجُزُ عَمْ مَعْرِفَةِ كُنْهِ جَلَالِهِ um, If you are unable to understand or, 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 or try to understand the reality, the true essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because there's the, the, the example of Allah and a king, there's no comparison. You can't compare a king of this dunya to um, al-malik, malik al-muluk. There's no comparison. But he's saying if you're unable to understand who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, then try to... Imagine yourself standing in front of a king of this dunya, of this time, and, and try to act in, in accordance to the way you would stand in front of a king of this time. So how would you stand in front of a king of this time? You wouldn't turn up, for example, in your rags. You would turn up and you're dressed appropriately. You wouldn't turn up, for example, and, and you're, you don't smell good. You would turn up and, you, and you've, tried, you've tried to make an effort. You wouldn't turn up and you're looking rough. You would try to make an effort. You wouldn't be falling asleep. And whilst you're standing in front of him, you would be awake. You would be, you would be um, taking, uh, making sure that you're awake. You would be concentrating, etc. So he says, likewise, in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how should you stand? If you take into consideration the way you would stand in front of a king, how would you stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And most people here, most people generally, if they had an appointment with a king, even if the king is not powerful. So for example, um, King Charles. We assume he's not powerful. The nation state has taken over. And so the, the, the power has shifted to, to um, the parliament and the politicians, etc. That's what we assume. Um, so how would you stand, though, if you were given an appointment with King Charles? How would you stand in front of him? How would you present yourself, etc.? cetera? Um, and it's not to say, I mean, you could, some people might say, oh, you shouldn't go to stand in front of him and don't lower yourself and the Muslim should be you know, strong and proud and so on. Yes, but the average person, the average person, if they're going to stand in front of a king, you know, a king that they like, for example, let's say there's a Muslim king. How would you stand in front of this Muslim king? 
Um, so he says, وَعْلَمْ فِي الْحَالِ أَنَّكَ قَائِمُ بَيْنِ يَدَيْ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ وَهُوَ مُطَّلِعٌ عَلَيْكَ فَقُمْ بَيْنِ يَدَيْهِ قِيَامَكَ بَيْنِ يَدَيْ بَعْضِ مُلُوكِ الزَّمَانِ إِنْ كُنْتَ تَعْجُزُ عَنْ مَعْرِفَةِ كُنْهِ جَلَالِ بَلْ قَدِّرْ فِي دَوَامِ قِيَامِكَ فِي صَلَاتِكَ أَنَّكَ مَلْحُوظٌ وَمَرْقُوبٌ بِعَيْنِ رَجْلٍ صَالِحٍ مِنْ أَهْلِكَ أَوْ مِمَّنْ تَرْغَبُ فِي أَنْ يَعْرِفَكَ بِالصَّلَاحِ He says, in fact, imagine um, that you are standing in your prayer and you are being watched and you are being supervised by someone who you assume to be righteous and who you want to have good thoughts of you from your family um, or anyone outside of your family, perhaps. Maybe if you have a teacher, for example, your teacher, and you want your teacher to assume that you are a righteous person or um, someone else. Imagine, you know, an, an alim was standing with us. If an alim was standing with us, an alim known um, in, in this dunya for his ilm and his salah and people will love him and want to, to be from his friends and companions and students, etc. How would you pray in front of this person? How would you pray? And the reality is most people, if they're praying in front of someone who is righteous and they want to be assumed righteous by that person, their salah would be slightly different, different from the salah by themselves. Um, so he says, if that helps, then uh, do it. He says, uh, Because if that's the case, if you're standing in that manner, if you're standing in front of an alim, you're standing in front of a righteous person, and you want that righteous person to see you as righteous, your, your body is going to be focused. Your limbs are going to be focused. You're going to be in a state of submission um, in, in your standing, etc. A person may ask, but isn't that showing God? Isn't that showing God? Initially, it's, you're not showing off. Why? Because the person isn't actually there. You're, you're giving yourself an example. How would I stand if this particular sheikh was standing with me? If this particular person was watching me, how would I pray? And then you say to yourself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees me. So how should I pray? Imagine if the Prophet ﷺ was watching you pray. How would you pray? If the Prophet ﷺ was watching you pray, how would you pray? One of my teachers, he used to say when um, he saw someone smoking, if the Prophet ﷺ was standing with you, would you smoke in front of him? And the obvious answer would be what? Even if the person says it's, 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 it's halal, but it's makruh. If you say to a person, are you going to smoke in front of the Prophet ﷺ, what would be the answer? No. Anyone with some shame in his heart would say no. And then my teacher would say, what about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allah is not with you. Allah does, doesn't see you. Um, and so likewise, in the same manner, you say to yourself, if the Prophet Sallallahu was here leading me in salah, how would I pray? If this alim was, was standing next to me praying, how would I pray? And then you remind yourself, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, Rabbul Alim, Rabbul Nabi Alayhi Salatu Salam, He's with me and He, see, he sees me pray, internally and externally. Um, then He says, وَأَمَّا النِّيَةِ So now he moves on to the intention. He says, فَعَزِمْ عَلَىٰ إِجَابَةِ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ فِي امْتِثَالِ أَمْرِهِ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَإِتْمَامِهَا So a person may ask, how can I have a present heart in the salah? What intention should I have? He gives the answer. He says, basically be resolute in answering the call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by obeying his command to establish the prayer and complete it. Um, so iqam salati is one thing, is to establish the prayer. Iqam salati is to establish it in your life, i.e. to pray the fara'id. And, and some of the ulama, they would say likewise to pray the rawatib. Why? Because the one who leaves off a sunnah mu'akkada is athim. Some may not know that. But if you leave off a sunnah mu'akkada, that which was always done by the Prophet wasalam, and the rawatib prayers, the sunnah prayers before and after the salawat, they are considered Min al muakkadat the sunan al muakkada um, If you leave that off consistently, that's considered to be a sin. You have to be praying those things. Um, so that's establishing the prayer. Well, it's mamiha. How do you complete the prayer? By making sure that you pray correctly, praying correctly. But it shouldn't go to an extent where you become over, um, what's the word? Uh, you overthink, you over worry, you over question yourself. Did I do this correctly? Did I do that correctly? And, you're, and the main point of the salah now becomes um, a physical ritual. The heart is not present. No, the, the physical side of the salah is there in order for the heart to be, to be there. So he says, um, and staying away from that which nullifies the salah. So when you hear the adhan and you stand, 
That should be your intention. I am answering the call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to establish the prayer, to complete the prayer, and to abstain from that which nullifies the prayer whilst I am praying. He says, likewise, وَإِخْلَاصِ جَمِيعِ ذَلِكَ لِوَجْهِ اللَّهِ سُبْحَانَهُ And um, you should have the intention, be resolute in making sure this salah is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we mentioned previously, some of the fuqaha you will find, for example, the Hanabila, the Shafi'iyya, um, they say, يُسْتَحَبُّ أَنْ نُطْقُ بِالنِّيَةِ And the Hanabila, they say, سِرًّا. Yeah, the Shafi'iyya, um, um, they will do it under their breath, uh, and it, it's not really a discussion amongst Shafi'iyya, but the Hanabila, they'll say, is it, does it mean internally, externally? But they say sirwan, that it's recommended for you to remind yourself, to, to enunciate the intention in the Salah. Why? They say it's mustahab, and we mentioned that the istihbab here is not that it's a fi'al of the Prophet ﷺ, but it's something that the fuqaha have made mustahab. Why? Because they saw that people have fallen into a state of ghafla, heedlessness. And so they say it's recommended that people remind themselves why they're coming to pray. Because it, it can happen. You come to salah, you forget which prayer you're praying, um, and, and you just say, Allahu Akbar, especially if your mind is racing. And so it's recommended to take a moment before the salah. You don't have to say it with your tongue, but at least with your heart. Take a moment and say, I'm praying zuhur for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sake. Just take a moment to remind yourself, I'm praying asr for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sake. I'm praying maghrib for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sake. Why? To, to make sure that you're starting with the right intention. Because if you start with the right intention and the intention goes wrong, halfway through, you can bring it back. And, um, and at least you're awarded for the beginning of the salah, that which was, was correct in its intention, etc. Um, but if you just enter into the salah, Allahu Akbar, and you don't know what you're doing, why you're starting, etc., perhaps you'll miss out on, on the reward. And so it's recommended that you take a moment just before the salah when you're standing up, for example. And that's why some of the fuqaha, such as the ahnaf, they say that the intention should not be um, uh, cut off from the takbirut al-ihram. That the takbirut al-ihram should take place um, just after the intention or roughly at the same time. So that the salah is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sake. Why? Because if you make the intention and then you're cut off, someone starts talking to you and then you come back and you say, Allahu Akbar, who are you praying for? What are you praying? Why are you praying? And we are, we are a uh, purpose-driven um, uh, creature, man. And the intention is very important to have an intention. And if we talk about the intention, we should also talk about the intention in everything else that we do. Everything that we do as Muslims, we should have an intention. The purpose of our existence in this dunya is what? To worship. To worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I should have the intention to worship Allah in everything that, that I do. In my workplace, in my home, in my family life. Even, for example, when I'm, like, if I work out, I should have the intention to build a strong um, uh, body for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When I'm, when I'm learning, when I'm reading, to build a strong mind for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When I'm working to earn money to use for Allah's sake, to provide for my family, to give da'wah in my workplace. Every place in my life should be a place of worship. Um, and it's important to think about that. Likewise, for those that are young and they haven't decided what career they're going to get into, choose something that you can use for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Go into something that you can use for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sake. If you're going to be an engineer, be an engineer for the deen of Allah. If you're going to be um, an author, author for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whatever it is, you can, you can use your skills and your body and your mind for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sake. And, and, and that's the, the way of the Muslims of the past. The great scientists, the great doctors, the great philosophers, etc. It was Islam that inspired them and pushed them. And many of them, their intention was to benefit men to benefit men. But in, in a capitalist society, our intention becomes what? To make as much money as possible, to make as much profit as possible. And Islam and profit, they don't go hand in hand in, in, in the capitalist way. They don't go hand in hand in the capitalist way. You cannot take the dunya and the deen at the same time. You have to choose one, deen or dunya. And if you choose deen, then you use the dunya for the sake of your deen. And, and this is something that, that we're, we're lacking in generally as an ummah, especially parents. How many parents they're concerned with the academic um, 
uh, opportunities, the academic success of their children, they're not really too com- concerned with the, the deen of their children. Um, you know, what are their children going to do for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? They're not concerned by those things. They're more concerned about making sure my child is able to get a good career, nice house, nice car, get married, settle down, things like that. But that's not why we're here. We're not here for that reason. We're not here to settle. This place is not um, Daru Qarar. It's Daru Ibtila. Um, it's, it's not a place of settling. It's a place of being tested. And then he says, رَجَاءً لِثَوَابِهِ وَخَوْفًا مِنْ عِقَابِهِ So you should have the intention that everything you're doing in your salah is for, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sake. And you should hope for his thawab, his reward, and at the same time be afraid of his punishment. وَطَلَبًا لِلْقُرْبَةِ مِنْ And seeking through your salah to be close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that salah is what? Dua. It's, it's your, the actual um, Arabic word salah comes, it basically means to supplicate. Um, and from sila, um, to have a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to supplicate. Um, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, the angels, they, get, they send their salawat upon, upon man i.e. they supplicate for man. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends his salawat upon those who, who send their salawat upon the Prophet ﷺ. Um, so when you are praying, your entire body is in a state of asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. With your entire body, you're saying, look at me, Ya Allah. Bring me close to me, to, to, to you, Ya Allah. Accept my prayer, Ya Allah. And so to remember that during the salah. Then he says, And so look, what does he say? Whilst realizing all of this is whilst realizing, basically realizing that your ability to call upon him and to actually establish the prayer is a blessing given to him, given to you by him, even though you are in a state of not deserving it because of the amount of sin that you engage in and the bad manners that you have, su'ul adib, the, the, the bad um, akhlaq that you show to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the bad adab that you show to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How so? By using that which he has gifted you in a way which is not pleasing to him, by being in a state of ghafla, by not remembering him as, as often as he deserves to be remembered and so on and so forth. With all of that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still allows us to pray. And that's the difference between the one who prays and the one who doesn't pray is that Allah has granted him that gift and Allah has not granted that gift to the other person. And so if you remember that, you will never look down upon another person who's not praying. You'll never look at a person and say, I'm better than him because I'm praying and he's not. You'll say, Alhamdulillah, that Allah granted me the salah. May Allah grant it for him too. Um, then he says, وَعَظِّمْ فِي نَفْسِكَ قَدْرَ مُنَاجَاتِ وَانْظُرْ مَنْ تُنَاجِي وَكَيْفَ تُنَاجِي وَبِمَاذَا تُنَاجِي he says, and basically, um, uh, like, uh, consider how great the one who you are calling upon actually is. And it's not possible to consider. We don't have the capacity to consider how great Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, but we can look to his creation and, and we can, we can, um, come to, um, you know, some sort of, of, uh, understanding. So if you look at the universe, who created the universe? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the universe. And if you really think about the universe and, and you, you read up on it, you know, nowadays we have so much information available to us um, about the planets, the stars, the distances between different galaxies, um, the, uh, the size of, of, of planets and stars, you know, what's happening in space and things like that. You know, our existence, our earth, how it's distance from the sun, what would happen if it moved slightly and so on and so forth. Uh, all of these things. If you think about all of these things and how things run so consistently and, and coherently and perfectly, then that will make you realize um, to a degree how great Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. And so he's saying, remind yourself and, and, and understand who it is that you're calling upon. Who is this that you're calling upon? And likewise, when it comes to our needs, when it comes to our needs, if I know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who has created all cures, when I'm sick and I turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm going to be relying totally upon him. When I know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who created poverty and wealth, and I turn to him and I'm impoverished, I have complete conviction 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will suffice me. When I know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who created knowledge and ignorance, and I turn to him in a state of ignorance, requesting that he grants me knowledge, I know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant me that which I ask for. I have conviction. Why? Because I'm looking at who it is that I'm calling upon. As we said previously, the example, if, if we heard that tomorrow at nine o'clock in the evening, a particular person is coming to Lewisham, this person is known to be um, extremely wealthy, and anyone who goes to him and asks him for, for, for money, he'll give. Most people are going to be rushing um, to ask. Um, and they'll be confident that you know they're going to get money from this person, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, due to the reputation. What's about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And if you read through the Quran, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? Alayhi Allahu bi kathin abda. Is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not sufficient for his slave? Will Allah, not, will Allah not suffice his slave? And so when you read, and this falls into the issue of studying aqidah. How do we study aqidah? We study aqidah to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that it increases us in iman. Not to know theological disputes and argumentations so that we can categorize people and know um, who is from Ahlul Bid'ah, who is from Ahlul uh, Dalala, who is from Ahlul Sunnah, etc. No, we study aqidah to know Allah so that we can turn to him in our lives properly with full conviction and full iman. Then he says, وَكَيْفَ تُنَاجِي How is it that you are calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? There, there, is a, a, there are mannerisms to calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, adab. And there is a surah in the Quran which teaches us how to call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Surah Al-Fatiha. We start by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then we, we continue to praise him until we get to ihdin as-sirat al-mustaqim. Guide us to the straight path. And, and, and the rest is a supplication. Guide us to the straight path, not to the path of those who went astray or have, have earned your anger. Um, uh, and prior to that, it's all uh, praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَبِمَاذَا تُنَاجِي And what is it that you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for? And of course, the best things to, to call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with are the ad'iyya of the Prophet sallam. Why? Because they are um, jami'a. They are inclusive of everything that you could possibly need to ask for. And so utilizing the, the ad'iyya of the Prophet sallam. Um, before you get married, for example, when you're married, um, there's there's a dua. What's the dua? Rabbi habli min azwaji wa dhukriyati qurrata a'yuni wa ja'alni lil muttaqina imama. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adab al-nar. Another example. Um, Allahumma aafini fi dini wa dunyaya wa ahli wa mali. Another example. Um, if you just pick up a book, for example, Al-Adqar by Imam Nawawi, um, and go through all of the, the ad'iyya, and try to memorize the ad'i of the Prophet sallam, which are inclusive of, of the good of this life and the next life. Then he says, And during this time, basically, you, your, your, um, your forehead should be um, sweating out of shame and embarrassment when you're standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Basically, you should be standing in a... In a uh, a state of shame and embarrassment. And your side should be shaking out of awe, reverence for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and your face should turn pale out of fear. If you if we truly someone might say how we're turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but if we truly understood the severity of the situation. And unfortunately for every single one of us, we will come to understand the severity of the situation when we leave this life. And we are actually standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we are worrying, am I going to receive my deeds in my right hand or my left hand? And then we're going to be truly worrying. And we're going to wish, if only I had feared Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the dunya so that I don't fear him in the akhirah. And so we have an opportunity to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now, to connect ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now. He says, وَأَمَّا التَّكْبِيرُ فَإِذَا نَطَقَ بِهِ لِسَانُكَ فَيَنْبَغِ أَلَّا يُكَذِّبَهُ قَلْبُكَ And so this is something which is very um, dangerous. What does he say? He says, as for the takbir, so the takbirat of the salah, whether it's the takbirat al-ihram um, or the takbirat al-intiqal, the first takbir or the takbirs of, 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 of uh, changing from standing to ruku' ruku' to sujood, etc. He says, when your tongue um, mentions the takbir, the Allahu Akbar, don't let your heart 
prove it to be a liar. So don't let your heart prove your tongue to be lying. How so? He says, فَإِن كَانَ فِي قَلْبِكَ شَيْءٌ هُوَ أَكْبَرُ مِنَ اللَّهِ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى فَاللَّهُ يَشْهَدُ إِنَّكَ لَكَادِدُ Because when you say Allahu Akbar, if there is anything in your heart that is greater to you than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah witnesses that. Allah sees that and Allah will see you as a liar. And then what does he say? Listen to this. He says, وَإِن كَانَ هَوَاكَ أَغْلَبُ عَلَيْكَ مِنْ أَمْرِ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ فَقَدْ اتَّخَدْتَهُ إِلَاهَكَ وَكَبَّرْتَهُ He says, if your desire and your passions and your whims are more beloved to you and greater to you, then the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you have taken your whims and your desires and your passions as your Lord, and you have revered them over Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the, the time that we're living in today. Just think about those who don't accept the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those who don't um, accept the framework of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those who question that which is clear cut. You have people questioning now that which is clear cut. Um, issues of uh, sexuality being being an obvious one, where people are trying to question why certain things are haram and trying to persuade themselves before others that there are other ways to view the sharia, etc. You're taking your whims and your desires and your passions as a Lord over Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those who are too lazy to pray, they're too lazy to pray. Why? Because they love the, the comfort and so on and so forth. They're close to taking their their passion or their desire, because laziness is a desire, desire to be comfortable and do nothing. So they're close to taking it as a Lord beside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, have you seen those who take their passions and their desires as Lords beside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And that's the time that we live in. We live in a time where people have taken their desire as their God, and they've taken their own selves, their, their self image as a God. They worship themselves and they worship their desires. That's the time that we're living in. He says, "For you, shikwa ayyakuna qawluka Allah qawluka Allahu akbar kalam al bilisan al mujarrad." He says that um, when that's the case, when you have something in your heart that's greater to you than the command of Allah and Allah subhanahu wa taala, then you are close to taking, um, or you're close to saying Allahu akbar simply with your tongue, stripped of meaning, stripped of of truth. وَقَدْ تَخَلَّفَ قَلْبُكَ عَنْ مُسَعَدَتِهِ and your heart has abstained from aiding your tongue. Um, and what's greater in danger than that? If it weren't for, and this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy, a tawbah and istighfar. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a tawwab, al ghafur. He is the one who accepts the tawbah of the one who turns to him, a ta'ib, and he is al ghafur, he accepts the mustaghfirin alahu. Uh, or, or Ilayhi, sorry, those who turn to him and seeking uh, his his forgiveness and his repentance. And um, if it weren't for the fact that we have good thoughts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be generous and will be overlooking. Why? Because it's very difficult sometimes to rid your heart of its passions and its desires. And that's the test of this life. And it's very difficult for us in this time as has been mentioned so many times over the last few weeks. Why? Because we live in a time where desires and passions and whims have been commodified. Your desires are worth a lot to major companies. If you didn't have desires, there would be no profit to be made. And so rather than helping us to tame our desires, these big companies, they encourage us to follow our desires. And you only have to look at the slogans of some of these big companies. Like, what's the... Uh, um, I believe the company is Just Eat. Just Eat, the name of the company. Um, and, and, and just look at all of these, these companies now, and they are encouraging you to follow your desires. The Sharia ah encourages you to say no to your desires, to say no to your passions. That's the whole point of fasting. The whole point in fasting is to learn how to say no. But here in the current world that we live, it's current iteration anyway, we're encouraged to say yes, we're encouraged to follow our desires. We're encouraged to spend our money on our desires. We're encouraged to be who we are and so on and so forth. All of these nonsensical statements. And the world should accept us for who we are. We don't have to change for the world. The world should accept us. What does that even mean? 
And that's based upon an assumption that man doesn't have to work on himself. That we are perfect just the way we are and, and so on. No, that's, that's, that goes against the Islamic framework. The Islamic framework and pretty much every other framework of, of, um, of philosophy uh, in, 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 in the last few, what, few thousand years has seen man as incomplete and he needs to work towards his completion. And similarly, knowledge. So knowledge, we assume knowledge is about making money. You learn to, 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 to earn. If there's no earning at the end of your learning, then the learning is, is in vain. There's no point to it. But that's not the Islamic perspective, nor is that the, the perspective of, of, of ancient frameworks. Ancient frameworks, the perspective was you learn to complete yourself, regardless of whether you earn at the end of your learning or not. There wasn't a correlation necessarily between learning and, and earning and, and, and becoming profitable. So if we just recap on this particular point, when we say Allahu Akbar, is our heart full of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or full of something else? And if our heart is full of something else, is our heart showing up our tongues and proving our tongues to be in a state of lying, etc.? And of course, a person shouldn't go into the extreme and start to assume I'm not a Muslim. I'm no longer a Muslim now because my heart has other than Allah in it. No, the point is to understand your weaknesses, to realize your deficiencies, to identify the problems you have in your heart and to rid your heart of those things slowly but surely um, as life is a, a marathon, not a sprint. Um, and the next one, وَأَمَّا دُعَاءُ istiftah. So he goes into the opening dua. And then he goes into the Qira'a and those two are quite long. Um, so we'll conclude with what we've taken for this evening, inshallah.